Well, good morning, all. It's uh, now 10 o'clock and, uh, and, and welcome to everybody. I'm uh, Ray Riddell. I'm the president of the Naturalist Club. <clears throat> and before we start, just wish to uh, say that the land on which we gather is the traditional uh, territory of the Maliseet, uh, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy nations who did sign peace and friendship treaties with the British Crown in the 1700s. Um, since we last spoke, uh, the club executive has been working very hard for you, uh, the members, um, and kudos to uh, Vicki Cowan, who's um, the vice president, and uh, Lauren McGovern, our treasurer, and Julie Bauer, our secretary, and Chuck Perry, our past president, who brings that uh, experience and uh, continuity to the group. The committees uh, are also very busy uh, managing our seven major projects. Uh, Mary Solos uh, heads up our program committee uh, is doing an excellent job as is Jim Wilson with the PLBO uh, and Monarch projects and Hank Scarth with uh, Greenlaw and our Shorebird project at uh, Irving Nature Park. As you know, uh, we have a, a been adopting a new format where we don't uh, talk about the minutes from last meeting or do club business financial reports uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, that All those details are now in the bulletin or basically uh, our newsletter and our increased social media. Uh, we have a website where you can get information. We have a Facebook page. Uh, we have Twitter and um, Instagram and our own YouTube channel. Uh, so special thanks to Patty McCarroll, who looks after our uh, website, Paul Mance, YouTube, uh, Chuck Perry, and Driscoll and Julie Power, who are our communications team, and have really, really taken it to uh, another level. Julie recently has arranged for a common address for all of our uh, social media platforms. Our bulletin uh, goes out every two months, and uh, Jan Riddell is preparing the one for March and uh, April. Uh, traditionally, it's only been sent to our paid up members, but uh, on a trial, it's now being sent to all our past members and uh, friends, and hopefully this will entice uh, some of them to renew their membership. Our membership is um, probably the highest it's been in five years for family memberships, but we can always use more members. Uh, and, um, and of course, um, it's $25 for a family, $20 for a single. Some highlights that are you're going to see in the uh, bulletin. Uh, <clears throat> Jim Wilson and his team uh, recently put together 3,400, that's 3,400 packets of milkweed seeds for distribution around the province. That's part of our Monarch uh, Conservation Project. Gina Lonati made a, a second uh, presentation of her excellent uh, presentation on right whales. And she made that to the entire grade nine cohort at uh, Harborview High School, plus the climate action group there, plus the staff and a special thanks to Karen Vickers who uh, set that up. That one was recorded um, and is now on our YouTube channel. So some of you who missed the first one can now um, get the, um, the recording there. Uh, incidentally, there is, a, as she mentioned, a documentary on right whales, which features a lot of um, uh, photography from our friend Nick Hawkins, and that's showing uh, two days only, and that's uh, uh, tomorrow and Monday at the Cineplex in, in St. John. So you know, if you have time, take that in. That should be uh, really, really good. Um, <clears throat> last week, Julie and I met with representatives of Nature Canada, several NGOs, and three MPs uh, to compare notes and further our, our efforts to conserve, study, enjoy, and educate. All of them were receptive and uh, are now aware of uh, the work that we do. Uh, Julie is developing some logos for our uh, projects and redesigning our business cards. And there will also be some details on the Festival of Nature, which is coming up in June. There's lots more information on the newsletter. Um, it, if, you, if you want one, get in touch with me or Julie, uh, but you should be getting them uh, shortly. I think uh, the deadline is uh, February 
24th uh, for insertions if you want to insert something and uh, it should be out um, March 1st. So if you don't get one, um, get in touch with me or Julie. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Mary Solos for her introduction uh, of our uh, special guest uh, presenter today. Mary. Okay, thanks Ray and good morning everyone. Um, before I introduce the guest speaker, I just would like to remind everybody that if you have any questions um, for our guest speaker, you can put them in chat and then Julie will read them out at the uh, end of the presentation and uh, Quinn can answer them. So with that, I'm really delighted to introduce this morning's guest speaker, Quinn Carvey. Quinn is currently a PhD student at UMB St. John. Now, originally from Michigan, Quinn earned a Bachelor of Science in Fisheries and Wildlife Management at Michigan State University. Pursuing a passion for research, Quinn has worked on over 16 projects and is interested in the spatial ecology of seabirds and using observation-based methods in combination with genetics to figure out where animals go and why. Personally, Quinn enjoys reading sci-fi and fantasy novels, going for runs and starting craft projects, but never finishing them. Well, so those, those craft projects can wait a little while longer. Um, so we can sit back and enjoy Quinn's presentation and remember to put your questions in the chat. So with that, I'll welcome Quinn and I'll hand the screen over to you. All right, thank you so much for that introduction. I will share my screen now. All right, so hopefully um, you are all seeing my screen now. Um, so thank you all for coming and thanks again for that great introduction. Uh, I'm really excited to be talking with you today. Uh, my title of my talk is The Wonderful World of Wildlife Research. And I was inspired by the fact that you are a naturalist club. And so today I'm going to be highlighting a few key research projects that I've worked on. And I'll be focusing on amazing natural history, sharing some ecological facts, and also highlighting research findings that have come out of uh, work studying these systems. And then finally, I'll be giving an overview of my current PhD research. So uh, as, uh, as Ben mentioned, mentioned, my name is Quinn Carvey. So I am originally from Michigan in the United States where I got my bachelor's degree in fisheries and wildlife management at Michigan State University. So I'm now doing my PhD research at the University of New Brunswick here in St. John, and I'm working with Dr. Heather Major. But before I started my PhD research, I worked on a lot of different research projects, and I really caught the research bug early. So when I was an undergrad at Michigan State University, I spent my summers doing different research projects. And then once I graduated, I did this work full time. So all in all, I've worked on over 16 different research projects. And these projects have been an opportunity for me to spend lots of hours observing the natural world while also collecting rigorous data to help gain an understanding of these ecological systems. This helps aid in conservation and inform government policies. So most of the work that I've done has been in North America with birds, but as you'll see, this isn't exclusively the case. So I've been able to travel to some really amazing places to do this research. And so I'm gonna be taking you to three of those places today. So the first place where we're going is the Maasai Mara National Reserve in Kenya, where I worked with spotted hyenas. So this is a long-term research project started in 1988 by Dr. Kay Holkamp at Michigan State University. So I worked on this project for several years while I was an undergrad with, uh, at Michigan State. So I spent a lot of time in the lab doing data work, but then I was really lucky and I was able to go with them to Kenya to work with hyenas in the field. And so one interesting way that this project is set up is that the reserve is divided into two different management regimes. So this Eastern part of the park here in the white, uh, these are three different hyena territories that are outlined. But this Eastern portion of the reserve is an area of high human impacts. So there is human settlements nearby, there is grazing and livestock allowed in this region of the park. And so there's a lot more human activity. 
However, in the western part of the park, um, there's also three hyena territories, but this is an area with low human impacts and low human development. So there's no towns, there's no grazing allowed, and there's also less tourism pressure in this region. And so this is really interesting because it sets up a sort of large scale natural experiment where you can compare the hyenas between these two different regions. So here's a little bit about the star of the show. So this is the spotted hyena or feci in Swahili. So hyenas are widespread across Africa, which you can see in this upper map here, um, showing the range distribution of the spotted hyena. They're found in diverse habitats from dry semi-desert areas to more lush tropical regions. And they are pursuit hunters, so they can hunt small and large game, either uh, hunting alone or together in a group. But they are also scavengers, and that makes up a large portion of their diet. Spotted hyenas have really powerful jaws that allow them to consume almost all of their prey, including bone of the animal. And so their poop is actually distinctively white because of this consumption of bone. So if you're out, if sometimes you collect fecal samples, you know right away which poop is a hyena's poop. <laughs> Uh, and really interesting, in hyenas, the females are larger than the males and they're more aggressive. And they also have external sex organs that resemble that of males, which in females are called the pseudophallus. And females actually give birth through this external sex organ. So they're interesting behaviorally, but they're also inter interesting physiologically compared to a lot of other mammal species. Hyenas live in social groups called clans, and these can exceed over 100 members, although they're typically smaller than that. And hyenas have this really complex social structure. So every hyena in the clan has a specific rank relative to the other members in the clan. And these ranks are reinforced through social interactions. And you can see that in this upper image here where we have hyenas doing a social sniff, which is a greeting behavior. So the hyena that's standing is in the dominant position, and the hyena that is on the ground is in the submissive position with its ears back. And so this is just one of the ways that uh, social rank is reinforced through all of these different hyena behaviors. And because females are larger and more aggressive, they are dominant. So each female has a specific rank relative to other females in the clan, again, reinforced through all of these behaviors. And when a female gives birth to offspring, which are called cubs, these cubs inherit her rank. So the cubs have all the same rank as their mom. However, if a male wants to be able to reproduce, they need to disperse and leave where they were born, and they need to immigrate into a new clan. And when they do this, they take on the low rank of an immigrant male. So as a result, females in a clan are ranked higher than all reproductively active males, which is a really interesting social uh, structure in this species. So when we're actually out in the field in Kenya, when we're not broken down in this, as you can see in this upper image here, where Sam is standing on a research car, uh, we spend most of our time conducting behavioral observations. And one cool thing that, about hyenas is that their spot patterns, especially on their sides that you can see large spot patterns, are unique to each individual. So we have a large binder of all the different hyenas and their photos, and so we can recognize them by their spot patterns. So when we conduct these behavioral observations, we can actually tie that to a specific known individual, and we know that hyena's rank. So these behavioral observations are used to help us understand this complex hyena society, and they, we can use this information to test specific research questions. Uh, one question I was working on while we were there was whether maternal behaviors differ between the two regions of the park that I mentioned. So maternal behavior in the high human impact area versus the low human impact area. And one really great place that you can observe a lot of hyena behavior is at their communal den. So the cubs of multiple females live in this underground den, which offers them protection. And you can sort of see that here in the lower right image where the female is sitting in sort of a depression. So she's actually sitting in the mouth of this communal den. And so each female can have up to two cubs 
at one time and they are black before they get their spots. So the cub in this photo is a, is a young cub still at the den and it still has, uh, it's still black. So it hasn't gained its spots. And so because there is a, there are a lot of females with cubs at the same den, there's a lot of activity that happens here. So it's a great place to watch for behaviors. And it also attracts other hyenas because of all the activity that aren't act that don't actually have cubs. So now I'm going to show a quick 30 second video of some of the activity that we could observe at the den. So in this video, we have a female with two of her cubs, which are still young enough that they don't have their spots yet. So I'll just play this video and then check back afterwards. All right, so that was part of our standard obs our standard observations that we do um, watching those hyena behaviors. But while I was out in Kenya, we also had a special project where we were deploying satellite GPS collars. So we were putting these collars on females. And what they do is they pinpoint the location and they transmit this location to satellites where we can then download the data and sort of get hyena movement in real time. So we put these collars on females that had cubs, and we also put them on females of high rank and females of low rank. That way we could compare the movement patterns we are seeing based on their social rank. So while with the hyenas are unconscious to put these uh, collars on, we also took some additional measurements. So you can see in the upper right image, we're measuring actually the size of the different teeth of the hyena. Uh, in the lower right image, we're measuring the width of the nipple. And then in the lower left image, we're collecting a milk sample. So we were, we actually milked hyenas, which is kind of a crazy thing that I can say I've done. Uh, so we collected these milk samples and we also collected blood samples for future different research um, analyses and projects that were ongoing. So we have the unconscious hyena and then we put it into our car and we drive it to a safe location for it to wake up where it won't be uh, interrupted by any other individuals. So you can see me in the back of the car. I'm ecstatic to be touching a hyena. Uh, and you can't even tell from this photo that the hyena has horrendous gas. And so I'm, but I'm still happy to be there. <laughs> so some interesting findings that have come out of the data from putting these satellite GPS collars on females, uh, you can see in this image. So, what we learned was that high ranking females travel a much smaller area relative to the den. So you can see that in this upper image where these are data points from females of high rank. And you can see that they're not spread out very far. They're pretty concentrated. And because the females had cubs, we know that they're staying relatively close to their den. However, if you compare that to females of low rank, which you can see in this lower image, they're actually covering a much wider area and they're traveling much further from their den. And you can actually see that they, in some cases, they're leaving the boundary of the reserve. So then they're also entering these regions where they may have less protections. So this really demonstrates uh, some of the ways that social rank can affect movement and behavior of these different hyenas. We also found that females of both ranks, so both high and low ranking females, traveled more quickly in the presence of livestock and they were more likely to remain within their territory. So this research shows that these hyenas are potentially adapting to the presence of human, uh, human uh, activity in the area, which when we've studied some other species such as lions, they were not able to achieve this flexibility. So this suggests some flexible adapt adaptation in these hyenas behaviorally. So now we are going to leave Kenya and we're going to go to South Florida and into the Everglades. So you can see on this uh, map that there's the star in the Southern Florida Peninsula. And then zoomed up, we have the region of the Everglades, which is divided into different national parks and a lot of different water conservation areas. 
So uh, here I worked on the South Florida Wading Bird Project. And this is the, lar the longest running wading bird uh, project in the world with over 20 years of systematic research. So this is a really important and really exciting project to work on. But before I talk about the birds, it is important to give a bit of context to the hydrology in the region. And that's what makes this area such amazing habitat for wading birds and other species. So the Everglades region is called Paheoki, which means grassy waters by the Seminole people. And you can really see that this is a, an extremely apt name from this photo. Where we have this wide swath of just marshy grassland that covers this whole region. And the Everglades then as a result is sort of acting as this slow moving river. And I mean slow because it slopes southward at just four and a half centimeters per kilometer. So it's a really shallow gradient. And this region is quite large. So it's the largest area without roads in all the United States outside of Alaska. However, there has been major development in the area, especially for agriculture and human settlement, which has resulted in a loss of 50% of the habitat in the region. Humans have also uh, changed the hydrology. Uh, and so this has resulted in a decreased water flow south, which has resulted in longer dry seasons and increased fires. If you're interested in the story of the development of the Everglades, uh, I highly recommend this book, The Swamp. Uh, it really goes into interesting detail about the politics of developing the Everglades and the proposed rest restoration projects that are going on now. But back to the birds. So this project monitors 11 species of wading bird, and I'm highlighting just a few in this, um, in this slide. So we have tricolored herons here. Uh, Glossy ibis, great egrets, white-faced ibis, roseate spoonbills, little blue herons, and wood storks. So there's some amazing diversity down in the Everglades um, that this slide just sort of touches upon. Um, it's really amazing to see all the different species down there. So these species nest together in these mixed species colonies, and they build their nest in what we call tree islands. So these are just shrubby clusters among the wide expanse of grass. So you can see that from the air really well in this photo where we have all of these different tree islands and these shrubs. So these are um, arranged across just the open expanse of the grass part of the Everglades. And from the air, you can also again see how the hydrology is shaping this whole region because all of these tree colonies are oriented north-south because of the slow moving waters uh, going towards the south. So to monitor the, the wading birds in this region, we travel to, eat, to each of the designated tree islands and we do that by airboat. So I was able to drive airboats through the Everglades, which is probably the most fun thing I've ever done in my whole life. <laughs> so this is the view from inside one of the tree colonies. Um, some of them are more wet than others and they all tend to get drier as the season goes on. And there's fine scale structuring happening within these colonies. So a lot of the smaller wading birds tend to nest uh, lower in the tree canopy with some of the larger birds nesting at the top. So you can see that here in this right image where we have wood storks nesting at the very top of the canopy. And so because a lot of these wading birds are uh, nesting so tall, in order to monitor them, we actually have long poles with mirrors on the end. And so we reach up the pole and we can kind of use it to look into the nest. And then we can see if the nest has chicks, if it has eggs and what sort of status they have. And the wood storks in particular, once the chicks get big, they really like to grab the mirror pole and throw it out of the nest uh, just to make your job very difficult. So when we're in the tree colonies, what we're doing primarily is monitoring breeding success. So we are following a subset of nests for all of these different species. We're tracking the status of the eggs and the chicks uh, when they hatch. So you can see here in this image, I've got my vest on with all my tools and I'm looking into one of the nests, which in this case is actually quite low. So we set up these transects within the tree colonies to monitor all of these different nests. And then in addition to our standard projects where we monitor this breeding success of these species, when I was there, we were also testing for mercury accumulation. So we were taking samples from blood, feathers, and eggs of different species. In addition to the mercury project, we were also looking for python activity. 
And so we did this in two ways. The first of which was to set up these cameras that could look into the nests of designated uh, wading birds. So we dragged in these really long poles, put a game camera on them, and then faced the camera into the nest, which you can see uh, in this image. So we were taking photos of nests, trying to capture python activity, but we were also collecting water samples to look for the presence of python by using a tool called environmental DNA. So if the python is swimming through the water, moving over some of the tree colony, they could be shedding skin cells and other DNA into the environment. So when we collect up water samples, we're trying to capture potential DNA that the python has shed into its environment that we can use to tell if it's there or not. And so, yes, we did find that there is python activity in these waiting bird colonies. So this was first confirmed through those cameras that we placed, which confirmed the depredation of waiting bird eggs and chicks. And you can see that in this photo that is from the paper published on this, where this is a Burmese python that's actively constricting two waiting bird chicks. It looks like maybe they're great egrets. So this is so Sophie Orzachowski's master's work uh, was doing this uh, Python research. So this is her uh, paper on, on this, um, but she also found the presence of Python through this environmental DNA tool and did find that Pythons were more likely to occupy these tree islands that have wait, active wading bird nests compared to tree islands that don't have any active wading birds. So they do seem to be showing a preference for these wading bird colonies. And these uh, Burmese pythons are an invasive species into the Everglades, which do, could be potentially having a large impact on these nesting wading birds, especially because she showed that they were operating in these kind of concentrated areas. So they could be having a large impact on specific colonies in particular. In addition to looking at breeding success, we also conduct aerial surveys across this region. And part of that is because it's, it's such a large area to cover, but also because so many of them are nesting from the top, it can be difficult to get an accurate count from the ground. So we do these aerial surveys and you can see what maybe one of these colonies could look like uh, in this image, which looks like it's mostly wood storks and great egrets here. So we do this so we can get these accurate estimates of nesting wading birds and see how they're distributed across this whole region, which is really important for conservation and management. And this is important because, because between the 1930s and the 1990s, there was an estimated 80 to 90 percent decline in the population of nesting wading birds in the region. And this was linked to extreme changes in hydrology that coincided with development. In 1996 and in 2000, there has been major legislation that's been passed to help with the restoration of the Everglades. And one of the key goals of both of these restoration projects is the return to a more uh, historic water flow. So in this image, you can see in the left, uh, this is the historic water flow of the region, where we have this wide swath of water moving south uh, to the coast along the peninsula. But because of human uh, diversion of water, Currently, what we're seeing is a diversion of water. Most of the water is going to the east and to the west, which is reducing the flow of water south, which goes through the Everglades itself, which is one of the reasons we're seeing loss of habitat and increased dry periods. So the goal of these re restoration projects is to restore the southward flow of water. And fortunately, many of these species now are meeting some of their recovery goals, although they are still below historic numbers. And wading bird uh, nesting numbers and distributions across the region are key metrics for showing the success of this restoration project. So this really highlights the importance of wading birds in the region, but also the importance of this long-term research uh, to help with some of our management and government policies. So we're leaving the Everglades now and we're going closer to home to Machaya Steel Island. So you may be familiar with this island, but if you're not, it's a small island southwest of Grand Manan, which you can see uh, in the star here on the map. So this uh, Machai Steel Island is located at the mouth of the Bay of Fundy, and this is where I'm doing my PhD research. So this is a long-term research project that's op been operating on this island, doing systematic research since 1995. 
And this research project has three main focal areas. So the first thing that we do is track breeding success of all of the different species that are breeding on the island. So we track the number of eggs laid in our, in our target nests, and then we track chick growth and chick survival. So you can see in this upper left image in this hand, uh, someone is holding a razorbill chick. We're probably getting growth measurements from that chick. So our second main uh, research focus is tracking survival of all of these different species. And we have one important tool that we use to help us do that, and that's banding birds. So you can see on this puffin that there are two metal leg bands on this individual. And so these metal bands are carved with a unique set of letters and numbers that only this individual has. So if we put these bands on this individual and then we use our binoculars, we use our spotting scopes, we can reobserve this individual, read its bands, and we know that that bird is still there on the island and we know it survived year to year if we're seeing it again and again. So we use this banding program to help track the survival of all the different species. Finally, uh, our last key focus of this project is doing diet studies. So we do this because adult uh, birds carry the fish back to their chicks in their bill. You can see that here in the lower image where the puffin is carrying all the different prey items. So because they carry them whole and they carry them externally, they're not uh, digesting and regurgitating to chicks, we're able to actually sit and observe with our binoculars and track the different prey items that they're bringing back to their chicks. So this way we're able to study the diet of the different seabirds pretty effectively. There are seven species of seabird which are breeding on Machaya Seal Island. First, we have razorbills, common murs, leeches storm petrels, arctic terns, common terns, common eiders, and Atlantic puffins. So for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna be focusing on talking about Atlantic puffins, and that's because this is the species for my focal research. So the Atlantic puffin is a cold water adapted species with, that's distributed across North America, or <laughs> across the North Atlantic, sorry. So you can see this uh, in the blue, which is their winter range. So you can see them distributed across the uh, North Atlantic Ocean. The orange represents their breeding range. And then the red box represents uh, my study area where Machaya Seal Island is just down here. So in Atlantic puffins, the males and females look similar. So if you're out on the colony and you're observing puffins, you can't tell just from looking at a puffin if it's a male or a female. Puffins are monogamous and both parents care for the eggs and chicks together. So they dig out a hole into the ground, which we call a burrow, and that's where the female will lay her single egg. And often these pairs return to the same breeding uh, burrow year to year. So in addition to puffins breeding on Machaya Seal Island, they're also breeding on four other islands in the Gulf of Maine. So you can see that here in this lower image where we have Machaya Seal Island, which is the furthest north, and then we have these four other islands distributed to the south. So Atlantic puffin uh, numbers are largest on Machaya Seal Island, where we have over 8,000 breeding pairs of puffins. And then Eastern Egg Rock, which is the furthest south, is, has the smallest population with just under 200 breeding pairs of puffins. But in general, uh, all of these five colonies are relatively small compared to some of the global colonies of puffins, which may have hundreds of thousands of pairs. So in the Gulf of Maine, where these puffins are breeding, this is the southern limit of their range. So if you remember back to that range map, puffins aren't breeding any further south, again, because they are this cold water adapted species. In addition, the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99% of the global ocean. So in this upper image, you can see where the Gulf of Maine, these are the uh, graphs, uh, are the warming trends. So you have this really dark red in the Gulf of Maine. And then you can also see the warming trends on this graph where this is the warming trend in the Gulf of Maine uh, relative to the warming trends across the other global ocean. So you can see that the Gulf of Maine relatively is warming much, much faster. And in correlation with these rising sea surface temperatures, we have seen shifts in the availability of high quality food items that seabirds use in this area. And this had negative effects on reproductive success and survival. So this is having some, some implications for our seabirds that we're already detecting. So given the environmental change that we're seeing in the Gulf of Maine, it's important to consider puffin breeding colonies uh, across Atlantic Canada. So if we take a bit of a step back away from the Gulf of Maine itself, 
There are large puffin breeding colonies to the north in Newfoundland, Quebec, and also in Labrador, which I'll be talking about less today. So given the ability of puffins to travel far distances, so they are capable of sustained flight and could make and can uh, make it to these regions, it's a question of if there is if there is much exchange between the Gulf of Maine and these northern colonies. However, this has not been assessed before, and so there is an unknown amount of activity moving between these two different regions. So if there is connectivity between the Gulf of Maine and these southern colonies with these larger colonies to the north in Newfoundland and Quebec, then this could have a lot of effects on the population dynamics in the region and how we think about conserving puffins in the Gulf of Maine. If individuals are dispersing from the Gulf of Maine, leaving the Gulf of Maine and going north, then this could offer an opportunity for them to escape some of these warming waters that we're seeing in the Gulf of Maine. Also, if individuals are leaving the northern colonies and dispersing into the Gulf of Maine, this could help support these smaller colonies that we have um, south where we are. But to investigate these different possibilities, uh, first we need to characterize the different dispersal patterns that we see in the region. And so this brings me to my PhD research, and I'll focus on kind of two main research questions that I have today. So the first question I have is, how does sex affect puffin dispersal? And has environmental change affected these patterns? And second, my other question is, are puffin colonies in the Bay of Fundy, which is where Machaya Seal Island is, are they genetically isolated from these northern colonies in the Quebec and, and, and in Newfoundland? So to answer these two different questions, I'm going to be using two different data sets. So these are the two data sets that I'm using. The first one I've sort of already introduced. So it's our capture mark recapture database, which is just using our banding data. So again, this is where we put these bands on the legs of different bird species. So this is where we've marked this bird. And then we can either recapture or reobserve it across time. So if we banned a bird five years ago, and then we, but we still see it today, we know that that bird has survived uh, those, those years. And also because we have research projects on Machaya Seal Island, but also on those four other Gulf of Maine colonies, someone could also see the bird we banded on Machaya Seal Island on, down on Eastern Egg Rock, and we would know that that bird has moved. So that's our capture mark recapture database. But I'm also using genetic tools to answer my second research question. And so in genetic studies, you only need a single biological sample, which could be a blood sample, or it could be a feather sample or something that contains DNA. And this is important because DNA has a lot of information about that individual's genetic identity, but it also has information on all its ancestors. So we can use this to help us answer some of our questions for where we don't have banding data. So I'll be using our banding data set for my first research question in the Gulf of Maine, but because we don't have banding data for these northern colonies, I'll be using genetic tools to help answer those questions. So for my first, going deep, more deeply into my first research question, I've mentioned that I'm going to be looking at the effect of sex on dispersal, and there are a few different reasons for this. So first, sex bias dispersal is very common among many different species. And this is where one sex disperses further or more frequently. So in birds, there, birds tend to actually show female bias dispersal. So in birds, females tend to either disperse further distances or they tend to disperse more often. And there are a few different reasons why one sex may disperse more than the other. And one hypothesis is that there are different costs and benefits for males and females to disperse. So one example of this could be if males need to search for mates, maybe it'd be really beneficial for them to disperse to do so. However, if a male is responsible for holding on to a territory, maybe they'll disperse less because they want to secure a territory in a habitat where they're already familiar with the resources. So these are just two different examples for how different costs and benefits could make males or females more likely to disperse. And it's also possible for a puffin's dispersal behavior to be affected by both its sex and by environmental change. And this is what I'm really interested in. So for example, if environmental change is affecting the different food availability in the region, which we do know that's happening in the Gulf of Maine, maybe the sex that needs more energy will disperse to find better habitat. So for example, maybe the female will be dispersing more to find higher quality habitat because she needs a lot of energy to lay an egg. 
So I can assess the effects of both sex and environmental to change together by using a mathematical model. So I can, using this model, I can tell if sex affects dispersal. I can see if environmental change affects dispersal. But then I can also see if the effect of environmental change on puffins dispersing is different for males and females. And so to do this, as I mentioned, I'm using our banding data set. So we have this data set of all of these puffins that we banded and then observed again. So I can use this to figure out which puffins have dispersed. And so to be dispersal in this context means that they left the island where they hatched, they moved to a new island to breed. So that's how I'm defining dispersal in this context. And so if we banded a chick on Machias Seal Island, and it was observed three years later on Eastern Egg Rock, we would say that this bird has dispersed to breed there. And so the model that I'm using is able to take this information and estimate the probability that it disperses. And it does this by assessing a few different variables to see what is affecting the probability of a puffin dispersing, such as its sex or different variables showing environmental change. And so visually, this is sort of what it looks like. So there's two outcomes that I'm interested in. So either a bird is going to disperse, it's going to move to a new island to breed, or it's going to stay on the island where it hatched to breed. These are the two outcomes I'm considering. And so this model kind of weighs different variables to see how much they affect these two different outcomes. So some of the variables I'm interested in, I've already mentioned, such as a bird sex, whether it's a male and female, I'm interested in if the availability of high quality food affects their dispersal decisions. And then also some metrics for environmental change, such as sea surface temperature. Then there's also different qualities of the different islands that also could influence a bird's decision, such as if an island has really high breeding success, maybe it wants to stay there instead of dispersing. And maybe the bird's body condition, how heavy it is, how large it is, could also affect whether it wants to disperse. And so this is sort of what the results could look like from this mathematical model. So we have these two outcomes, a bird is gonna not disperse or it's going to disperse. And there's a, these are the different variables that I'm interested in seeing how they affect these decisions. So for example, if a bird is in poor breeding success, so it's negative, it's, it's in bad condition, maybe it's not going to disperse because it just doesn't have the energy. If the, bird, if the island is doing great, there's lots of healthy puffin chicks, maybe that bird also will choose not to disperse. Why would it leave uh, an area where it's got a good thing going? In contrast, if a bird is maybe a female because of uh, what we see in other birds, it could just be in general more likely to disperse. If sea surface temperatures are warming and making habitat less suitable, perhaps this would also increase the probability of a bird dispersing. If there's less good food around, it also could increase the probability of a bird dispersing because they need to search for areas with more energy. And so this model kind of puts all the different weights of these variables together to estimate what affects dispersal probabilities. And so this is the approach that I'm using to figure out whether a puffin sex and environmental change that we're seeing in the Gulf of Maine, if this is affecting these dispersal behaviors. And so I'm actively analyzing this data right now. And so it's tuned back soon for some results. <laughs> So for my first research question, I was using our banding data to figure out the effects of sex and environmental change on dispersal probabilities in puffins. But if I want to see how isolated these colonies are in the Gulf of Maine from these larger colonies to the north in Newfoundland and Quebec, I need to use genetic tools. And so now I'm going to be moving on to my second research question, which is are puffin colonies in the Bay of Fundy genetically isolated from these northern colonies in Quebec and Newfoundland? And so the reason I'm using this genetic data is because of how isolated and large these colonies are. So you can imagine if we put a band on a puffin on Machias Steel Island and that puffin left and went to Newfoundland, that's one puffin among hundreds of thousands of breeding pairs of puffins. And so the odds that we are able to see that bird again are just extremely low. And so I'm using genetic tools to help estimate how much gene flow is happening in this region. So I can use these genetic tools to see how genetically different these colonies are. And from these genetic differences, estimate this gene flow. So gene flow is just the actual genetic exchange of material. So if a bird moved to Newfoundland, 
it would reproduce there and disperse its DNA into that, into that region, which we could capture with genetic tools. So to answer my question, the first step is to collect blood samples. So I collected blood samples in 2021 from adult breeding puffins on the Chaya Seal Island. And then we also have research partners working in Quebec and in Newfoundland who sent us blood samples from their puffins, which are breeding there. So once I have these blood samples, I extract the DNA from the blood. And you can actually see that here in this test tube. This is a vial containing concentrated puffin DNA. So this is uh, puffin 1015-14410's DNA. So once I have this puffin's DNA, I can determine this puffin's sex genetically. And so if you remember back to earlier when I said that you can't tell if a puffin is a male or a female just by looking at it, so to figure out if sex is going to affect some of these things I'm interested in, I can do that genetically. I can figure out if a puffin is a male or a female using its DNA. And this is what it looks like when I do this. So um, this is a gel of, this is uh, showing individual puffins. So each row um, column is a different puffin. So this is puffin eight. 08578, this puffin down here is puffin 14485. And so these four puffins in the red box, these are females. And so I know that they're females because they have two of these bands. So this here is one bird, but it's got two bands. And so those two bands tell me that this bird is a female. And this is because females in birds have two different sex chromosomes. So in humans, it's the male that has two different sex chromosomes, but in birds, the female has two sex chromosomes and the male has the two of the same sex chromosome. So here, what we're actually seeing is one sex chromosome for the female and then the second sex chromosome. But because the males have two of the same, they just show up as one band. And so this is actually how I'm able to tell genetically if a puffin is a male or a female. So once I have the puffin's DNA and I know its sex, I can send this DNA away, DNA away to be sequenced. And so this is currently where I am in my project. I've sent my DNA away to be sequenced and I will be getting some data back soon. So this is what the data could look like. So if you look in this top row, we just have a long string of letters, which is C, A's, G's, and T's. And if you think back to your early biology classes, you may remember that those are the four bases that make up DNA. And so from the sequencer, I'm going to be getting I'm going to be getting these sequences for millions of tiny pieces of DNA from each of the puffins that I from each of the puffins that I have DNA for. And then I'm able to, from this data, I can conduct some analyses to estimate how genetically different the puffins are from one another, and then estimate how much gene flow is, is occurring. So from the sequences of DNA that I get, I'm going to be looking for different patterns that could explain the genetic differences that I'm seeing. And so this could look something like this graph here. So each of these dots would represent a different individual and how close they are and how far apart they are shows how related they are to one another. So if two dots are really close together, that means that they're really closely related. And if they're really far apart, then they're less related to one another. And so some of the questions I could answer is how genetically different are the different colonies from one another? So where are they breeding? So if each of these different colors represents a different colony, I could say, wow, all the puffins in Newfoundland are, they're kind of, they're not as closely related as the puffins from Machias Seal Island are. And based on this distance, I could also see the puffins that are maybe further breeding further apart are less related. So maybe the genetic differences I'm seeing are explained by geographic distance between the different colonies. So these are just some of the questions I'll be able to address by analyzing all of the different DNA uh, data that I get back from the sequencer. So based on how genetically different all of these different birds are um, and from these different colonies, I can estimate how much gene flow has to be occurring to tell me how, how genetically different these are. And perhaps I'll even notice that males or females actually are showing more gene flow. And that would show me that maybe there is sex bias dispersal happening. So if one bird, one sex is dispersing more frequently, if, if females are dispersing more frequently, they would be spreading their DNA more than males are. So I could be able, I might be able to assess that from the data that I'm getting. 
So from these genetic tools, I'll be able to assess how much gene flow there is from the birds that are breeding in the Bay of Fundy with those birds that are breeding in the North in Quebec and Newfoundland. And so I can do all of this without actually having to observe dispersal of these puffins physically with my eyes. So this is a really exciting um, advancement for science. So again, stay tuned uh, for results from this project because hopefully I'll be getting the data back from the sequencer soon. So just to summarize these two main research questions, uh, for my PhD research, I'm going to first be assessing how sex affects puffin dispersal and if environmental change is affecting these patterns. Second, I'm going to be looking to see if puffin colonies in the Bay of Fundy are genetically isolated from these northern colonies. And so through this work, I, it's important because dispersal offers this opportunity for individuals to respond to changes that they're experiencing. So species and populations can sometimes evolve to adapt to new environments, but this isn't going to happen at the scale of one individual's lifetime. So dispersal offers this opportunity within their lifetime to respond to these environmental changes. And by understanding what influences these dispersal patterns and how maybe these patterns are changing with environmental change, I can see how these connections among puffin breeding colonies could change in the Gulf of Maine that's experiencing this warming. In addition, the movement of these different individuals among the colonies is important for population growth in the region. So the number of birds that are going into a colony and the number of birds that are leaving a colony affects its growth rate. So my work is going to help us predict if puffin populations in the region will grow, remain stable, or may decrease with these changing environmental conditions. Finally, through my genetic work, I'll be assessing how connected these colonies in the Bay of Fundy are with these colonies to the north. And this will ultimately help us uh, identify if there's potential rescue from or escape to these northern regions for this Gulf of Maine population of puffins, which we know are breeding in these warming waters. So thank you so much for coming to my talk about the wonderful world of wildlife research. I would like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Heather Major, who supervises all of my PhD research, um, in addition to my committee members who offer their guidance. Uh, there are infinite people who help us get to the field to Machias Seal Island. Um, our funding agencies, which have funded our long-term research and my PhD research as well. And then also our collaborators who help us um, get, this, get, get this data across the Gulf of Maine and Atlantic Canada. So thank you. Thank you so much, Quinn. That was just <laughs> fascinating. And I'm really looking forward to um, once you hear back from the data analysis. I'm just going to go over the questions here. Um, we have quite a few. So uh, oops, where did it go here? Okay, so um, back towards the beginning of your talk, um, Vicki was asking, uh, she said, I see the hyenas travel about 50 kilometers from the den. Would that mean there would be no other dens within that area or do the ranges overlap a fair amount? Yes, so typically, um, typically each clan kind of has one communal den, although sometimes you will in large clans, you will see um, multiple communal dens within um, one single territory. So usually because the female is kind of tied to her den in some ways when she actually has cubs, um, she could be, she will be traveling, but ultimately coming back regularly to that same den. So they can, sometimes hyenas will travel uh, into other territories and leave those boundaries when they're searching for food and other resources. Um, so yeah, that could be explain some of those spatial patterns. And um, what age do hyena cubs get their spots? Oh gosh, that's a question I should I should know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty, it is relatively early. So cubs will still be nursing from their um, mothers and they will still have spots. So I had a lot of other things I wanted to show, some other cute photos, but um, they will, you will see kind of large cubs with spots still nursing from their mothers. So I'm not actually sure of the exact age, um, maybe like a month or two or something. That seems about right, <laughs> but don't quote me. <laughs> Okay, and um, do you know how many puffins have been banded? Yes, actually, I was just looking at this. Um, so I think we have, so I, was, I mostly am interested in puffins that we've banded as chicks because we know how old they are. 
Um, and so I think since 1995, just on Machaya Seal Island, we have banded over 6,000 puffins wow. of just chicks. Yes. Wow. <laughs> and have any puffins moved back and forth between the southern and northern colonies that you know of? Yes. And so I'm really interested in those individuals. So I've been looking through our large database and I've been specifically looking for those birds. So I have um, so I have some that I will be able to genetically sex because we have feather samples from them going back to 2005 when we started collecting feathers. So I think there are almost 50 puffins with feather samples that have dispersed. So I'll be looking at those. And then we also have some that we just don't have feather samples for. So I think in total, it's around 100 birds I've confirmed that looks like they have dispersed from their, from their history. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me see here. Else. At what life stage or breeding stage would you expect the puffins or other seabirds to disperse? Yes. Um, so as far as we know, once a puffin makes a decision to breed in one island, we don't have any evidence that it, it moves to a new island to breed. So a puffin, it hatches and it grows for a long time in its burrow and then it leaves the island on its own. And once it leaves the island, it's going to spend anywhere from three to five years uh, maturing. It's going to actually come back to some of these colonies just to kind of look at, check things out. And we call this a prospecting period. So it will investigate different colonies before it chooses to start breeding. And so once it makes that breeding decision, generally or starting around age four or five, that's when it will have decided on a specific island. And then as far as we know, it doesn't move to a new island to breed. Okay, and another question back to the Everglades. Um, who's leading the restoration efforts there? Is it a state initiative? And what kind of projects are they doing to improve the situation? For example, do they redirect water, establish protected areas? Are there any storm resiliency initiatives that you know of? Yeah, I can speak to some of that. I'm not super familiar, um, but I know at least what the legislation in 2000 that is um, the major piece of restoration legislation is actually a joint federal and state initiative and I think at the time it was maybe the largest restoration project budget that had ever occurred in the United States. And a lot of that is because there is a lot of infrastructure change that needs to happen in the way that they manage water. Um, they have an extensive system of canals that diverts water. Um, and also agriculture is sucking out a lot of water to use. Um, so a lot of the restoration plans I think is kind of an engineering restoration plan to help divert more of that water flow um, while also still balancing our human use of the region. Um, I don't know about storm infrastructure. Um, I know one of the problems that they're having because of the loss of water going south, they are experiencing some saltwater intrusion because you have less water leaving the peninsula, the saltwater is able to actually creep in further. Um, so I think that there is other projects to kind of deal with that side. And I know Florida is super vulnerable to storm surge given climate change. So I know they have initiatives that are around that. I'm not sure if it's related to the restoration. Okay, and I think we have time for just one more question. Um, how many eggs will a puffin lay over her lifetime? And how many of these will hatch and reach reproductive age? I know you don't know the exact numbers, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, as I said, the females will lay one single egg per year. Sometimes if there's something happens to the egg really early on, they sometimes will relay one egg. Um, that is, you know, maybe a toss up of if that will happen. Um, I think our, our average success of a chick growing big enough to leave its burrow, our long term average is 56%. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a tough life for a puffin chick. Um, it is, there are really good years and then there are also really bad years. So, you know, I think in some years it'll be like 80% will leave and then in other years it'll be really bad. So 2021 was a really bad season for puffins and we had functionally a 0% success rate, oh, which no. was the worst season on record. Um, so it was really bad, but we also have big the year before was a really good year. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think the 
the survival rate for puffins is lowest before they start breeding when they're still young and trying to figure things out. So I think they have um, a 75% chance once they've fledged, the, the little chick is left. I think they have a 75% chance of coming back at a five years, five years old. And then after that, their survival goes up as they're adults. Mm, okay, that's good. Okay, I think that's all the questions we have time for today. I'm just gonna pass it right over to Mary. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Julie. And uh, uh, I would really love to thank you, Quinn, for that presentation. It was really amazing um, that your uh, experience in Kenya and in the Everglades, uh, I'm sure the knowledge that you've gained about techniques and, um, and animals in general behavior, um, is really helping you with your project now. So it, it was extremely fascinating. And of course, Machaya Seal Island is uh, really near and dear to the hearts of a lot of members in our club. And um, speaking from experience, it's one of the most amazing experiences to visit that island. And it's really important, I think, that we learn um, about some of the research that's going on and some of the challenges that uh, our seabirds are facing. So thank you so much for covering everything from hyenas to puffins to uh, uh, seabirds, uh, pythons as well. You've had an exciting life already. This is really great. Um, so with that, I really would like to thank you, Quinn. Yeah, thank you and so much for having me. Yeah, that was, it was amazing. Um, and before we leave, I'd just like to invite everyone uh, to attend our next presentation. It'll be on Saturday, March the 19th at 10 a.m. And our guest speaker will be Todd Watts. Um, he'll be talking about searching for species at risk and areas of ecological significance within the traditional territory of the Pescatumagadi. So please check the Nature St. John website and Facebook page closer to that date for more meeting details. Um, so with that, thanks again, Quinn, and thank you everyone for joining us and have a great day. Bye. Thanks, bye.